If you remember from our last video, the kidney contains more than a million functional filtering units called nephrons. It's the nephrons that do the job in the kidney. In this video, we're going to zoom in on the nephron and look at how it does this job, what it's actually doing in each stage, and get into the details of how uh, this system is adjustable. In a quick recap of the anatomy of a, of a nephron, we have the Bowman's capsule, which is where the filtering occurs, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. The capillaries that are associated with the kidney, with the nephron, uh, are the glomerular capillaries inside the Bowman's capsule, the afferent arterial leading in, the efferent arterial leading out, and then we have this capillary bed that surrounds the loop of Henle. This is called the vasa recta, and these capillaries will be, in the capillaries also around the proximal and convoluted, uh, proximal and distal convoluted tubules, will also be picking materials back up from the nephron during this, this system. Uh, and again, the final product being made as we filter the blood, make the adjustments to that filtrate, we finally will produce urine. Now, the basic principles, uh, the basic principles of urine formation. The goal of urine production is to maintain the volume and composition of the blood, and this requires the elimination of organic waste, most importantly urea, creatine, and uric acid. To do this, we have to mix it with water, but water loss must be kept to a minimum. Uh, at the same time, useful solutes must be reabsorbed. So if you also recall from our last video, we talked about two ways to go about kind of cleaning out the blood, as if you were cleaning out a closet or a, or a toy basket or a toy bin. Uh, you could either go through the toy bucket and pick out just the toys you want to get rid of, or you could dump the whole toy bucket out, uh, find the things you want, put them back in the bucket, and then keep the stuff that you took out that you don't want, just not put it back in. And we said that's a better analogy for how the, the, the nephron's going to work. Um, so we've got to take out water, but we don't want to lose too much water, otherwise we'll dehydrate. We want to take out most everything and put the useful solutes back in. To accomplish these goals, there's three basic uh, processes that are going to occur during uh, the ne in while we're in the nephron. Uh, filtration, where we take from the blood into the nephron, we filter the blood. Tubular reabsorption, where we go from the nephron and we put back into the blood. And then finally, tubular secretion, where we go back in, check on the things that we didn't get out the first time, uh, and put them into the nephron. So again, we take everything out of the closet we, as much as we can. Then we put back into the closet or back into the toy box that which we want to keep. And then maybe we double check and make sure there's nothing left in that closet or in the toy bucket that we really want to get rid of. Those are the three, the three processes. As we go through the nephron and we go through each part, we're going to talk about which, where each of those things happen, uh, how they happen, and um, under the influence of what hormones. Now, I thought about trying to make my own animation, but I thought the best way would be to show you a uh, bunch of short animations uh, and then explain them, uh, kind of recap them, and then finally do a quick review, uh, basically following uh, this process from start to finish uh, until we see what we're doing here. The outer part of the kidney is called the cortex. Inside the cortex is the medulla. Urine collects in the renal pelvis and drains from the kidney through a tube called the ureter. A tiny branch of the renal artery carries blood to each nephron for processing. A tiny vein carries blood away. Blood pressure forces fluid through the walls of a cluster of capillaries called the glomerulus, and it collects in the cup-shaped Bowman's capsule. The filtrate is refined as it passes through the twisted nephron tubule. Useful substances are returned to the blood, and the remainder collects as urine. Refined urine is carried by the collecting duct into the renal pelvis for excretion from the body. Nephrons regulate the composition of blood by a combination of three processes that transfer materials between the nephron tubules and the capillaries that serve them, filtration, secretion, and reabsorption. A nephron tubule and the blood vessels surrounding it have been straightened and simplified in this diagram. The gradation of color, lighter on top, darker on the bottom, corresponds to an increasing concentration of solutes in the interstitial fluid surrounding the nephron toward the center of the kidney. As blood flows through the glomerulus, a knot of porous capillaries, 
Water and virtually all other molecules small enough are forced by blood pressure out of the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule. This process is called filtration, and the fluid that accumulates in Bowman's capsule is called filtrate. Blood contains blood cells, plasma proteins, water, sodium chloride, hydrogen ions, bicarbonate ions, urea, glucose, amino acids, and possibly some drugs and poisons. Blood cells and plasma proteins stay in the blood. They are just too big. But all the other substances are filtered from the blood and form the filtrate that accumulates in the nephron tubule. As the filtrate moves along the proximal tubule, certain substances are transported from the blood and added to the filtrate, a process called secretion. Secretion of hydrogen ions helps to regulate body pH. Certain poisons are also secreted to remove them from the blood. This list summarizes substances contained in the filtrate. Filtration is not selective, so some of these substances are useful to the body, and it is important that they be returned to the blood. The kidneys generally need to recover water, sodium chloride, bicarbonate ions, and nutrients such as glucose and amino acids. This reclamation of valuable solutes and water is called reabsorption. Let's look at the process of reabsorption as the filtrate continues its journey through the nephron tubule. In the proximal tubule, reabsorption of bicarbonate ions helps regulate the blood's pH. Sodium chloride, glucose, and amino acids are actively transported out of the filtrate. This leaves the filtrate more dilute than the surrounding interstitial fluid, so water follows by osmosis. These solutes and water re-enter the blood. As the filtrate moves down the loop of Henle, the concentration of solutes increases in the interstitial fluid surrounding the nephron tubule. Since this portion of the tubule is permeable to water, water leaves by osmosis and is reabsorbed into the blood. This concentrates the filtrate. In the ascending loop, the surrounding fluid becomes more dilute. This portion of the loop is impermeable to water, but not sodium chloride. Sodium chloride diffuses out, lowering the solute concentration of the filtrate and adding to the solute concentration of the surrounding fluid. Near the top of the loop, sodium chloride is actively transported out, further diluting the filtrate. More substances are reabsorbed from the distal tubule. Sodium chloride is actively transported out of the filtrate. Bicarbonate ions may be reabsorbed too, helping to regulate body pH. Some drugs and poisons are secreted from the blood into the filtrate at this point. And this is another place where hydrogen ions may also be secreted into the filtrate to further adjust pH. There is a lot going on here. The main point is that the nephron is able to expel unneeded or harmful substances from the blood by filtration and secretion into the filtrate, and the nephron can reabsorb substances useful to the body. The filtrate enters the collecting duct. As it moves down the collecting duct, it passes through a region where the surrounding fluid has a higher and higher solute concentration. Water leaves the collecting duct by osmosis, concentrating the remaining filtrate into urine. Urea is one of the main body wastes in urine, but here some urea actually diffuses out of the filtrate. The urea performs a useful function by adding to the solute concentration of the interstitial fluid and causing even more water to be reabsorbed from the filtrate. Even though most of the water has been reabsorbed from the filtrate, urine is still 95% water. The most abundant solute is urea, along with other nitrogenous wastes. There is some sodium chloride and traces of other ions such as calcium and potassium. Hydrogen ions make urine acidic, and drugs and toxins may also be present. Hormones regulate water reabsorption by the nephron tubule in response to body fluid intake and loss. On a hot day, when you're sweaty and thirsty, blood solute concentration rises. In response, the brain signals the posterior pituitary to increase its output of the hormone ADH. ADH makes the walls of the collecting duct more permeable to water. Recall that the interstitial fluid surrounding the nephron tubule has a high solute concentration. 
ADH allows more water to leave the filtrate by osmosis and re-enter the blood. The body conserves water and concentrated urine is produced. When you have been drinking more water and not losing much fluid, the blood becomes more dilute. The brain responds by decreasing the secretion of ADH. The collecting duct becomes less permeable and less water is reabsorbed. The body produces dilute urine. Okay, so as you saw, we'll start with filtration. In the Bowman's capsule, the glomerular capillaries, we get a lot of filtering out. Um, we have a tremendous capacity to filter the blood. A couple interesting things. We have a lot of surface area. We have long capillaries. These capillaries are very permeable, and the blood's under a lot of pressure. All that equals lots of stuff coming out of the blood. What's interesting to note are the things that don't come out of the blood. Cellular components do not come out, and large plasma proteins do not come out. However, a lot of things come out of the blood that we would rather stay in the blood, so we're going to have to put it back as we go through. 99% uh, of all the stuff that we filter out in the glomerular capillaries in the Bowman's capsule will get reabsorbed during the, the, the trek through the nephron. As we move through the nephron's tubules, most of the water and many of the other solutes are going to come out of the tubules into the peritubular capillaries, peri meaning around, tubular, around the tubes, around the nephron, uh, back into the blood. However, um, some of the materials that we didn't get out of the blood the first pass through, uh, we will take out during secretion. So this filtrate is processed. Um, the essential organic compounds must be recovered. We want to get back our sugars and other inorganic solutes, including potassium and sodium bicarbonate. We're going to regulate hydrogen ions, which is going to adjust the pH, um, and we're going to get rid of those organic wastes. It's interesting to note that as we go through the nephron, uh, different parts of the nephron vary in their composition and their permeability. We're going to see that some parts of the nephron are very permeable to water and others are not. Some are uh, very permeable to salt and some are not and we'll have to look at that in great detail in class. So after we leave the Bowman's capsule we enter the proximal convoluted tubule and in the proximal convoluted tubule we're going to reabsorb a great deal of uh, material. We're going to reabsorb organic nutrients. We're going to reabsorb ions and other molecules and we're going to start to actually recapture a lot of our water. However, we're also going to have some things coming the other direction from the blood into the into the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, uh, particularly hydrogen ions and potassium ions. Leaving the proximal tubule, we'll begin our descent through the loop of Henle. In the loop of Henle, we're going to regain, regain much of the remaining water, sodium and chloride. Um, we have a remarkable ability of this loop of Henle to recover water. The length of the loop of Henle uh, will be different in different types of animals. We know form relates to function. In an animal like the kangaroo rat, uh, which lives in the desert in very dry climates, they have extremely long a loop of Henle. And the longer the loop of Henle, the more water we get back. So if you think about it, the basic function of the loop of Henle is to get back the water. In doing so, though, we actually have to get back a lot of salt. We're going to spend a lot of time uh, in class on the loop of Henle. There's also a counter current thing going on here where you see the blood flow uh, going up here, down here, opposite the current of the filtrate traveling down here and up on this side. This counter current exchange is going to maximize our transfers. Uh, we'll look at that in more detail in class also. Another issue we have to look more closely at is the change in permeability. The descending loop is permeable to water, but not solutes. Uh, but the ascending loop is, is permeable is not permeable to either. But we're going to pump solutes out, and then when we get to the, um, it's going to change the osmolarity or the hypertonic uh, solution outside those tubules. This change in permeability and the, and the way that the, the cells of the nephron work in the loop of Henle result in a positive feedback loop where pushing out ions in one spot, it's going to pull water from the other spot, which is going to raise the level of concentration of ions in the other spot, which in turn is going to increase the movement of those ions out, which then pulls water. And we're going to see a very specific uh, um, kind of uh, acceleration of the process using this positive feedback system. As we get to the distal convoluted tubule, we're going to further adjust our ion levels with sodium chloride. We may take a more, another stab at getting some water back. We're also going to look at the function or the influence of certain uh, hormones like aldosterone, which is a hormone that's going to uh, stimulate sodium recovery. 
and when we get to the collecting duct, we're going to see the function of another hormone, ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, which is going to influence the amount of water we recapture.